Chapter Two, Part Two of The Shadow Line: A Confession by Joseph Conrad. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine. Chapter Two, Part Two. Presently, I relented, slowed down, and said, "What I really wanted was to get a fresh grip. I felt it was time. Is that so very mad?" He made no answer. We were issuing from the avenue. On the bridge over the canal, a dark, irresolute figure seemed to be awaiting something or somebody. It was a Malay policeman, barefooted in his blue uniform. The silver band on his little round cap shone dimly in the light of the street lamp. He peered in our direction timidly. Before we could come up to him, he turned about and walked in front of us in the direction of the jetty. The distance was some hundred yards, and then I found my coolies squatting on their heels. They had kept the pole on their shoulders, and all my worldly goods still tied to the pole were resting on the ground between them. As far as the eye could reach along the quay, there was not another soul abroad except the police peon who saluted us. It seems he had detained the coolies as suspicious characters and had forbidden them the jetty. But at a sign from me, he took off the embargo with alacrity. The two patient fellows, rising together with a faint grunt, trotted off along the planks, and I prepared to take my leave of Captain Giles, who stood there with an air as though his mission were drawing to a close. It could not be denied that he had done it all, and while I hesitated about an appropriate sentence, he made himself heard. I expect you'll have your hands pretty full of tangled-up business. I asked him what made him think so, and he answered that it was his general experience of the world. Ship a long time away from her port, owners inaccessible by cable, and the only man who could explain matters dead and buried. And you yourself new to the business in a way, he concluded in a sort of unanswerable tone. Don't insist, I said. I know it only too well. I only wish you could impart to me some small portion of your experience before I go. As it can't be done in ten minutes, I had better not begin to ask you. There's that harbour launch waiting for me too, but I won't feel really at peace till I have that ship of mine out in the Indian Ocean. He remarked casually that from Bangkok to the Indian Ocean was a pretty long step, and this murmur, like a dim flash from a dark lantern, showed me for a moment the broad belt of islands and reefs between that unknown ship, which was mine, and the freedom of the great waters of the globe. But I felt no apprehension. I was familiar enough with the archipelago by that time. Extreme patience and extreme care would see me through the region of broken land, of faint airs and of dead water, to where I would feel at last my command swing on the great swell and list over to the great breath of regular winds that would give her the feeling of a large, more intense life. The road would be long. All roads are long that lead towards one's heart's desire. But this road my mind's eye could see on a chart, professionally, with all its complications and difficulties, yet simple enough in a way. One is a seaman or one is not, and I had no doubt of being one. The only part I was a stranger to was the Gulf of Siam, and I mentioned this to Captain Giles. Not that I was concerned very much. It belonged to the same region, the nature of which I knew, into whose very soul I seemed to have looked during the last months of that existence with which I had broken now, suddenly, as one parts with some enchanting company. The gulf, ay, a funny piece of water, that, said Captain Giles. Funny, in this connection, was a vague word. The whole thing sounded like an opinion uttered by a cautious person, mindful of actions for slander. I didn't inquire as to the nature of that funniness. There was really no time. But at the very last he volunteered a warning. Whatever you do, keep to the east side of it. The west side is dangerous at this time of the year. Don't let anything tempt you over. You'll find nothing but trouble there. Though I could hardly imagine what could tempt me to involve my ship amongst the currents and reefs of the Malay shore, I thanked him for the advice. He gripped my extended arm warmly, and the end of our acquaintance came suddenly in the words, Good night. That was all he said, good night. Nothing more. I don't know what I intended to say, but surprise made me swallow it, whatever it was. I choked slightly and then exclaimed with a sort of nervous haste, Oh, good night, Captain Giles, good night. 
His movements were always deliberate, but his back had receded some distance along the deserted quay before I collected myself enough to follow his example and made a half turn in the direction of the jetty. Only my movements were not deliberate. I hurried down to the steps and leaped into the launch. Before I had fairly landed in her stern sheets, the slim little craft darted away from the jetty with a sudden swirl of her propeller and the hard, rapid puffing of the exhaust in her vaguely gleaming brass funnel amidships. The misty churning at her stern was the only sound in the world. The shore lay plunged in the silence of the deepest slumber. I watched the town recede still and soundless in the hot night, till the abrupt hail, steam launch, ahoy, made me spin round, face forward. We were close to a white, ghostly steamer. Lights shone on her decks in her portholes, and the same voice shouted from her, Is that our passenger? It is, I yelled. Her crew had been obviously on the jump. I could hear them running about. The modern spirit of haste was loudly vocal in the orders to heave away on the cable, to lower the side ladder, in an urgent request to me to come along, sir. We have been delayed three hours for you. Our time is seven o'clock, you know. I stepped on the deck. I said, No, I don't know. The spirit of modern hurry was embodied in a thin, long-armed, long-legged man with a closely clipped grey beard. His meagre hand was hot and dry. He declared feverishly, I am hanged if I would have waited another five minutes, harbour-master or no harbour-master. That's your own business, I said. I didn't ask you to wait for me. I hope you don't expect any supper, he burst out. This isn't a boarding-house afloat. You are the first passenger I ever had in my life and I hope to goodness you will be the last. I made no answer to this hospitable communication, and indeed he didn't wait for any, bolting away on his bridge to get his ship under way. For the four days he had me on board, he did not depart from that half-hostile attitude. His ship having been delayed three hours on my account, he couldn't forgive me for not being a more distinguished person. He was not exactly outspoken about it, but that feeling of annoyed wonder was peeping out perpetually in his talk. He was absurd. He was also a man of much experience, which he liked to trot out, but no greater contrast with Captain Giles could have been imagined. He would have amused me if I had wanted to be amused, but I did not want to be amused. I was like a lover looking forward to a meeting. Human hostility was nothing to me. I thought of my unknown ship, it was amusement enough, torment enough, occupation enough. He perceived my state, for his wits were sufficiently sharp for that, and he poked sly fun at my preoccupation in the manner some nasty, cynical old men assume towards the dreams and illusions of youth. I, on my side, refrained from questioning him as to the appearance of my ship, though I knew that being in Bangkok every month or so he must have known her by sight. I was not going to expose the ship, my ship, to some slighting reference. He was the first really unsympathetic man I had ever come in contact with. My education was far from being finished, though I didn't know it. No, I didn't know it. All I knew was that he disliked me and had some contempt for my person. Why? Apparently because his ship had been delayed three hours on my account. Who was I to have such a thing done for me? Such a thing had never been done for him. It was a sort of jealous indignation. My expectation, mingled with fear, was wrought to its highest pitch. How slow had been the days of the passage, and how soon they were over. One morning early we crossed the bar, and while the sun was rising splendidly over the flat spaces of the land, we steamed up the innumerable bends, passed under the shadow of the great gilt pagoda, and reached the outskirts of the town. There it was, spread largely on both banks, the oriental capital which had as yet suffered no white conqueror, an expanse of brown houses of bamboo, of mats, of leaves, of a vegetable matter style of architecture, sprung out of the brown soil on the banks of the muddy river. It was amazing to think that in those miles of human habitations there was not probably half a dozen pounds of nails. Some of those houses of sticks and grass, like the nests of an aquatic race, clung to the low shores. Others seemed to grow out of the water. Others again floated in long anchored rows in the very middle of the stream. 
Here and there in the distance, above the crowded mob of low brown roof ridges, towered great piles of masonry, king's palace, temples, gorgeous and dilapidated, crumbling under the vertical sunlight, tremendous, overpowering, almost palpable, which seemed to enter one's breast with the breath of one's nostrils and soak into one's limbs through every pore of one's skin. The ridiculous victim of jealousy had for some reason or other to stop his engines just then. The steamer drifted slowly up with the tide. Oblivious of my new surroundings, I walked the deck in anxious, deadened abstraction, a commingling of romantic reverie with a very practical survey of my qualifications. For the time was approaching for me to behold my command and to prove my worth in the ultimate test of my profession. Suddenly I heard myself called by that imbecile. He was beckoning me to come up on his bridge. I didn't care very much for that, but as it seemed that he had something particular to say, I went up the ladder. He laid his hand on my shoulder and gave me a slight turn, pointing with his other arm at the same time. There, that's your ship, Captain, he said. I felt a thump in my breast, only one, as if my heart had then ceased to beat. There were ten or more ships moored along the bank, and the one he meant was partly hidden from my sight by her next astern. He said, we'll drift abreast her in a moment. What was his tone? Mocking, threatening, or only indifferent? I could not tell. I suspected some malice in this unexpected manifestation of interest. He left me, and I leaned over the rail of the bridge, looking over the side. I dared not raise my eyes. Yet it had to be done, and indeed I could not have helped myself. I believe I trembled. But directly my eyes had rested on my ship, all my fear vanished. It went off swiftly like a bad dream. Only that a dream leaves no shame behind it, and that I felt a momentary shame at my unworthy suspicions. Yes, there she was. Her hull, her rigging, filled my eye with a great content. That feeling of life emptiness which had made me so restless for the last few months, lost its bitter plausibility, its evil influence, dissolved in a flow of joyous emotion. At the first glance I saw that she was a high-class vessel, a harmonious creature in the lines of her fine body, in the proportioned tallness of her spars. Whatever her age and her history, she had preserved the stamp of her origin. She was one of those crafts that, in virtue of their design and complete finish, will never look old. Amongst her companions moored to the bank, and all bigger than herself, she looked like a creature of high breed, an Arab steed in a string of cart horses. A voice behind me said, in a nasty, equivocal tone, I hope you are satisfied with her, Captain. I did not even turn my head. It was the master of the steamer, and whatever he meant, Whatever he thought of her, I knew that, like some rare women, she was one of those creatures whose mere existence is enough to awaken an unselfish delight. One feels that it is good to be in the world in which she has her being. That illusion of life and character, which charms one in men's finest handiwork, radiated from her. An enormous balk of teakwood timber swung over her hatchway, lifeless matter, looking heavier and bigger than anything aboard of her. When they started lowering it, the surge of the tackle sent a quiver through her from waterline to the trucks up the fine nerves of her rigging, as though she had shuddered at the weight. It seemed cruel to load her so. Half an hour later, putting my foot on her deck for the first time, I received the feeling of deep physical satisfaction. Nothing could equal the fullness of that moment, the ideal completeness of that emotional experience which had come to me without the preliminary toil and disenchantments of an obscure career. My rapid glance ran over her, enveloped, appropriated the form, concreting the abstract sentiment of my command. A lot of details perceptible to a seaman struck my eye vividly in that instant. For the rest, I saw her disengaged from the material conditions of her being. The shore to which she was moored was as if it did not exist. What were to me all the countries of the globe? In all the parts of the world washed by navigable waters, our relation to each other would be the same, and more intimate than there are words to express in the language. Apart from that, every scene and episode would be a mere passing show. The very gang of yellow coolies busy about the main hatch, 
was less substantial than the stuff dreams are made of. For who on earth would dream of Chinamen? I went aft, ascended the poop, where under the awning gleamed the brasses of the yacht-like fittings, the polished surfaces of the rails, the glass of the skylights. Right aft, two seamen, busy cleaning the steering gear with the reflected ripples of light running playfully up their bent backs, went on with their work, unaware of me and of the almost affectionate glance I threw at them in passing towards the companionway of the cabin. The doors stood wide open. The slide was pushed right back. The half-turn of the staircase cut off the view of the lobby. A low humming ascended from below, but it stopped abruptly at the sound of my descending footsteps. End of chapter 2 Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine